Hi, my name is Dan. I'm quite a close friend with a lot of the uh, committee for Astro Sox, so I keep getting events like this where I can talk about my field. And today I'm going to keep on talking about my field, specifically my PhD in direct dark matter detection, how I got here. And then uh, before that, what dark matter is and how to get you all up to speed on what I do. So let's do that. Let me take you on a little journey through my undergrad. So you're probably asking after that, what kind of journey am I going to take you on and should I be scared? Well, the answer to one of those is no, hopefully not. But the answer to the second is that we'll start off by kind of I'll introduce myself and introduce my life story and hopefully not bore you to tears. And then I'm going to explain some of the stuff that I first started to learn about dark matter, how it works, what our current knowledge of it is and how we're trying to advance that. And then after that, I'm going to use the kind of stuff that we learned there and apply that to two experiments that I worked on in the past in direct dark matter detection. A bit of summer internship work that I did in an experiment in Birmingham called News G and my current starting PhD work on an experiment called LZ, short for Lux Zeppelin. So uh, let's go. And let's then immediately stop because throughout the uh, presentation, I'll be giving warnings such as this a great big slab of text saying physics alert. Now, I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this, but there will be some physics in this talk. I, I am a particle physicist and I will be talking about some stuff in my field. Any physics that I mention or any specific explanations will have some trigger warnings like this attached to them, just so that you can either switch on your physics brain at that point, or you can take advantage of YouTube's very handy skip forward button, or at the very least doubling speed. So keep that in mind. I know that physics can get dull at some points, so I won't judge you for doing that, don't you worry. So you're safe to just keep on skipping ahead when you see, in great big word art text, physics alert. But now you're probably asking, who's this weirdo who just told me that he wouldn't judge me for skipping through his crappy presentation that he's making? So just who is this that's speaking here? Well, my name is Daniel Hunt. I prefer Dan, but I'll go by Daniel sometimes. This is me talking in an AstroSoc presentation just one year ago almost to the day. I'm a former master's student at Birmingham doing a uh, master's in physics with particle physics and cosmology, and I'm just starting my PhD in particle physics at Oxford working on the LZ experiment. I was also, as a point of pride here, the Pointing Physical Society Big Name in Physics 2019, and I was cruelly snubbed of my award in 2020 through the caveat that a person can't win the award twice. Though I will soon be the first big name in physics in Birmingham history to not be studying at the University of Birmingham. Watch this space. Shenanigans aside, I did actually like learn some physics over the course of my PhD as well, uh, over the course of my undergrad rather. And part of this was learning about dark matter. So let's get into that. But I'm not just gonna give you the answer straight away. Like I had to put in effort to learn about what dark matter is. So I'm gonna make you put in a little bit of effort and eventually we're gonna work out ourselves just what we know about dark matter and how that led to our current understanding of it. Though don't worry too much, there's not gonna be a class test at the end of this. However, we're gonna take a little step back now. We're gonna put our thinking caps on and we're gonna stroke our chins very thoughtfully. And we're gonna think to ourselves, starting from the question, what is dark matter? But then I'm going to take a step back from that and realize that that's a very loaded question. There's a lot of other smaller problems that are all wrapped up in this one. So there's this thing called dark matter. We've not seen it. It's an, un it's an unknown problem in physics, which as immediately poses the question, why haven't we found it? Now, if we haven't found it, Either there's something we don't know about it, which is a problem in its own right, or there's something we do know about it that makes it very hard to find with our current tech that we've got out there. If that's the case, what do we know about it? What kind of stuff do we have to whittle down the search a little bit? And on top of that, how do we know the things that we know about dark matter that have led to us trying to search for it in the first place? So let's keep all of those ideas in the back of our heads. And we're going to get ourselves a little bit of evidence 
that we had at the beginning of our searches for dark matter. So don't worry, I'm, I'm not expecting you to have done your research into dark matter, though if you are interested, that's pretty great as well. Send me an email, I need some interns at some point. So we're going to go through two specific pieces of evidence for dark matter. I've done talks for Astrosoc before where I've done more details, gone a little bit more elaborate, and the link for that will be sneakily hidden at some point during this presentation, don't you worry. So the first piece of evidence we're going to look at is some research by Vera Rubin in, I believe, the 80s or so. Vera is an astrophysicist. Some people are. I, I don't judge them for it. And she was looking at what's known as the orbital velocity of galaxies, so how fast the, out, the parts of a galaxy are spinning. And she was looking at this at different distances from the center of a galaxy, and she found that for almost all the galaxies she was looking at, the speed on the outside more or less matched speeds towards the inside, which didn't match what you'd expect for just a clump of mass at the center and then less mass around the outside. The only real explanation was for if there was some kind of mass that she couldn't see around the outside that was causing the speed to maintain the same. Which is interesting, wouldn't you agree? And then Fritz, Zwicky, and some people like him come along, and they start spotting this process called gravitational lensing. Now, this is a relativity thing, I won't go too much into it, not worthy of its own physics alert, but it turns out that light bends around heavy things. This is how a black hole happens to an extent. The light bends all the way back and it gets sucked into the middle of the hole. And they were finding that light around galaxies was bending more than it should with their current maths, which either tells you that their maths is wrong or that there's something there that they can't see with their telescopes that's making the light bend. So we're getting a kind of a picture of two problems in physics here that are coming from the same source. And we'll get to that. So let's have a think about those two bits of experiment. And you've probably thought to yourself at this point, aha, I've got it. There's something out there that has mass. And on top of that, it's something that we can't see. It's dark. This means that it also, I'll, I'll throw you this one for free because you've done a very good job at spotting those two points. It also doesn't have any electromagnetic effect, which say that it doesn't couple to the electromagnetic force. Chuck it in a magnetic field, it wouldn't do anything. This also means that it doesn't have the property that's associated with electromagnetic effects. So it doesn't have a charge, not positive or negative. Also, if we can't see it and we can't see anything attached to it, that means it doesn't do many nuclear decays. Now, someone like me had come along after that and say that that places an upper limit on the coupling to the weak interaction. But that basically means it doesn't decay much. It doesn't make many alpha, beta, gamma particles. And that's still something of interest, that we don't know just how much it decays. We also don't know how much its mass is, but it's still something to work with. We also have a pretty good idea now because of these results of just how much stuff dark matter is, or more specifically, how little stuff there is that is matter that we know every day, like your table, the microphone I'm talking into here, that kind of stuff. Approximately the Regular baryonic matter in the universe is about 5% of it. After that, around 25 or so percent is dark matter. There's also this other property called dark energy, which is associated with the expansion of the universe. The kind of There's an energy that was put into the universe as it began to expand, and this is the only way to reconcile the fact that things, things exploded outwards faster than they should have. But that's something that I'm not qualified to talk about, and it's something that's very hard to prove with a big detector full of gas. So we'll leave that one for today at least. But I am qualified still to talk about dark matter, at least from some people's perspectives. I'm sure either me in a couple of years' time or someone else will come along and tell me how completely wrong I am with a lot of things that I'm saying here. That's the beauty of preserving things on YouTube for all to see. But I do know some stuff about dark matter, as much as you can know. So we're now going to ask the question, what is this? We know that it has a mass. We know that we can't see it. We know that it does some nuclear stuff or none. The leading candidate in terms of, uh, in, in very general terms, is known as a WIMP, a weakly interacting massive particle. 
It has a middle range mass going from around 1 GeV to 1000 GeV, maybe even higher. Thank you very much past me for not filling in that number. And we assume that it's weakly interacting. Everything in the universe, more or less, has a weak interaction attached to it. Atoms do, so that's pretty much everything. Most cosmic rays will have some coupling to the weak interaction, so it makes sense that this thing out there that we don't know anything about would probably also do some weak interactions every now and again. Don't worry, there are other models out there and other experiments that don't presume weakly interacting. We won't focus on those here, though for these other models and some specific types of WIMP rather than the, just the general model, I'll be talking about these in a couple of days' time during my next talk. Be there or be square. So we assume a WIMP. What does it do? How can we find it? Well, in my most technical of terms, and technical terms in the particle physics community, we're going to talk about dark matter in terms of making, shaking, and breaking. Making is the process of bringing a lot of standard model of regular matter together and hoping that a dark matter comes out. This is normally associated with a lot of models, things like QCD and QED and other acronyms that make me cry start being brought up very quickly, which makes it very uninteresting to talk about in public seminars like this. So we're not going to talk about that one. The second process is something that I am going to talk about, the process of shaking. Dark matter colliding with regular matter and not really doing anything but just coming back out. And that's something that can tell you a lot because we know a lot about the way that regular matter operates. So we can already see if it's acting a bit weird. The other kind is one that's a bit more difficult to probe and it's the idea of dark matter interacting with itself to produce standard model particles. This is what we were talking about when we were talking about how you can't see it decay that much. If it did break quite a lot, we'd see some cosmic rays from the sky that are like in higher numbers than we'd expect. And then we can say, ah, something we can't see out there is making those. Hallelujah. But we can't do that. But there's still some experiments that look at using dark matter, putting it in like a, a magnetic field or something and seeing what comes out. One of these, for example, is the CERN Axion Solar Telescope, which is something that I'll be talking about in some detail in the talk in a couple of days. But back to me for a second. Picture this. I'm at the end of my third year and I've not done any internships. I'm desperately thinking to myself, crapping Christ, I need some summer work. I need to do something, get myself busy out there, get my hands dirty if I want to do research for a living. And I think, hey, a friend of mine, Jackie, is another close friend of the Astrosoc committee as well. But she's also working on this experiment called News G. Can you get me a job on News G? I really want to be able to help in any way that I can. Signed, Dan. Send email. Jackie contacts Costas, her supervisor for the summer, and I do as well. And I managed to land myself an internship working for the News G collaboration over that summer. After doing a bit of teaching and other stuff, I had a very busy time. And then right after this talk that I have with Costas about working for News G, I take a step back and I think to myself, What's News G? And that's a question that we're going to ask ourselves right now, and we're going to go on another little journey to talk about just what News G is as an experiment and why you should care about that collection of letters right there. But before we do that, we're going to take, we're going to put the brakes on for a second and we're going to have our second physics alert. And we're going to go through a couple of detector components out there. So you've probably come across an anode if you do chemistry or if you did GCSE physics. You might remember the acronym positive anode, negative is cathode or PANIC for short. An anode is a thing with a positive charge. It attracts negative things. Usually it's part of a circuit. Right here, it's, for us, it's going to be part of a circuit. Spoiler alert. You've also probably come across the term ionization. Now, to ionize something is to make it, it as an atom emit an electron, so it becomes positively charged or negatively charged if you're gaining more electrons, but that's a chemistry thing. And finally, avalanche. You've probably come across the term avalanche before, probably more often than the other two terms here. But in a physics context, it means much the same as you'd expect from 
a snow context. A small interaction happens at the beginning, this produces more interactions, which produce more interactions, and it becomes this cascading chain reaction. And that's something that a lot of experiments take advantage of, a lot of dark matter experiments in particular. So, News G is an experiment that's located in Bowlby in Yorkshire, near to Sheffield. It's also located in Sackley, Paris, and it's located in Canada at a location called Snow Lab, as well as wherever else they've designed, decided to build another one of these things and what day of the week it is. They've been building a lot of them. News G is short for New Experiments with Spheres Gas. It contains gas. It's a spherical detector, as you can see at the very center of this quite nice diagram. And it's a novel way of detecting dark matter, hence the new experiments. We're not very good at acronyms. It's capable of detecting very light dark matter candidates at a very low price, the low price being why they're able to build so many of them all the time. It contains gas inside, as it says in the name, so it can detect very light dark matter candidates. But of course, there's a lot of avalanches and whatnot going on inside of it. We'll get back to that. It also contains just a single anode. So it's that single anode is sensitive to every single small interaction that happens around it, making it a very sensitive detector. The chamber is also completely spherical inside, as you can see, which also means that you can produce the maximum amount of coverage for a single anode, which again feeds into the uh, fuel economy of the device. So my work specifically was in the summer of last year, working on nitrogen tests with this detector, simulating, analyzing data, that sort of thing. So here is our news G detector. As you can see in the center, we've got a single anode right in the middle, held up by a small bar, and the entire thing is full of argon. And this detector is set up quite a bit underground, you know? And we leave it there. Until something manages to make it through the several hundred meters of ground between the surface and the detector. A proton, for example. This proton goes into the detector. And it gets quite close to these noble gas atoms inside. And it hits them in a process called nuclear recoil. Now this nuclear recoil, any atom with any particle with mass can do it. And it causes this atom to get knocked back a little bit and gives it a bit of energy in the process. This little bolt of energy it has ionizes the atom. So you've got some electrons going around in the chamber as well. This negative electron is now attracted to the positive anode and it's being pulled in towards it, rapidly building up energy as it goes. This energy causes an avalanche. It can start to produce more and more electrons by either knocking them off of more noble gases or a bit of pair production, we call it. So it starts to produce more and more electrons as it's going. And all of these electrons are picked up by the anode to get the signal that we detect as the proton or neutron or dark matter candidate just continues through the detector at that point. Now, how do we work with this signal? I'll take a step back here and give you a little physics alert. We're actually going to be talking about some analysis methods here. The electrons will hit the anode in the following sort of pattern. So you've got a very rapid spike at the beginning when a lot of electrons are very quickly hitting the anode, which gradually tails off for some of the outliers and the electrons that have been dragged around a little bit, they've scattered a little bit, gradually make their way towards the detector in the time scale of just a few nanoseconds. <laughs> so after that, you've got the following sort of plot. And you can immediately say to yourself, hey, there's an amplitude to this plot. There's a certain height that the plot goes to. And this can tell you something about the total amount of energy that's been deposited by whatever particle has been traveling through. You've also got this property called the rise time. The Technical description is that it's the time to go from 10% of the signal to 90%, but it's basically how steep the curve is. And this naturally tells you how quickly the energy has been deposited. If it's all deposited at once, all the electrons will hit at the same time, and that will basically be a 90 degree incline. Now, these two measurements are fairly unique to most kinds of radiation that will be inside the detector. And as a result, if you take your rise time and your amplitude and a few other properties 
and they don't match what you'd expect for other kinds of radiation, like uh, protons, neutrons, electrons, kaons, muons, other particles that end with on. If it doesn't match any of those, you found yourself a dark matter. And not only that, but you can use the properties that you've now found to make a prediction as to the mass range of this new particle you found, which can then be passed on to other experiments, which can search in much more detail within that sort of mass range. But for all intents and purposes, you've just found a dark matter right there. But enough about News G, though praise to Yanis uh, Katsulas and Kostas Nikolopoulos in Birmingham for their exceptional work on News G. And uh, hi to Jackie if she's watching this. I hope the PhD is going well. So I do my work over the summer working on News G, and I quite enjoy it. Again, kudos to those people. And I enjoy it enough that at some point or another, at the beginning of last year, Astrosoc ask me to do a talk for them of some kind, just to fill in one of the slots they've got. And I decide, hey, dark matter's cool. Dark matter detectors are cool, I found out now. Let's do a talk on this. And I'd say that it, it went reasonably well. Like, it's no real big deal, nothing much to talk about. But I do end up talking about this one experiment during it. Uh, there's a lot of experiments, and you can click the link at some point to find out or copy and paste it. But I do talk about this one particular experiment called LZ, short for Lux Zeppelin. And I only mention it in passing. I mentioned that it's another neat little experiment that's going to become a thing in the next year or so. And then on an unrelated note, I start going to PhD interviews. I've worked on my master's project on a project called NA62, which doesn't have much to do with dark matter detection and is therefore not even the slightest bit interesting to you people. And we will not bring it up again. But I go to these PhD interviews and I start applying for an experiment called LHCB, a CERN experiment. And during these interviews, I do very well at the general interview, pat on the back for myself there. I do reasonably well at explaining some of the general concepts and some of the theory behind particle physics. And then I absolutely bomb the LHCB interview. I start explaining incorrectly how detectors work in front of the people who built those detectors for the first time. Didn't go well. But at, just before this interview, in fact, looking through the schedule of interviews that would be available, I, mention, I see LZ as an option. And I asked to meet Hans Kraus and have a small interview style discussion with him, talk about his experiment. And he explains how LZ works. And I go to myself, hang on, this is very similar to the way News G works. And it really catches my attention. And it's good that it did. And it's clear that I caught Hans's attention because I now have a PhD working on this experiment with his team. But I might be repeating myself here. You might get a sense of deja vu. But after this interview, I take a step back and I think to myself, what the hell is LZ? So let's go on a second journey to find out what LZ is and why we should care about that acronym. So the rest of this presentation is actually going to get onto the meat and potatoes of my work. What is LZ? Why should you care about it? What are the current plans with it? And also what kind of experiments led to LZ? Because these things don't really happen in a bubble, as you will very clearly see soon. So what is LZ? To answer that, we're going to talk about Zeppelin, or specifically, we're going to talk about the oldest or most recent version of Zeppelin, Zeppelin 3. Zeppelin stands for Zoned Proportional Scintillation in Liquid Noble Gases, because again, we're absolutely terrible at making acronyms. Zeppelin 3 was located in Bulby, my home almost my home, so I'm, I'm still going to count it as my home. A little pat on the back again there. It's a uh, another direct dark matter detector, works similarly to News G, but slightly different in ways that I won't be talking about here. It ran from around 2006 to 2011, and it didn't find anything. But it was able to play some interesting constraints. We'll be looking at a plot a little bit later on as to just how these experiments are still useful, even if they don't find the dark matter. And then after this, a, another, well, a bunch of experiments come along, but one of the ones in particular that comes along is LUX. LUX 
It stands for Large Underground Xenon Experiment. It uses something called a time projection chamber, which we'll get back to. And it has a lot of photomultiplier tubes on the top and the bottom, which again, we'll get back to. It cost $10 billion to construct, which is something that I don't need to get back to. You know just how much money that is. It's a lot. But I think it was worth it, to be honest. It developed this interesting uh, dual phase detection system, which is something we'll get back to at some point. Don't worry. It was located in the home stake mine of South Dakota. Particle physics fans out there will know the home stake mine for the home stake experiment related to neutrinos. The people of you out there, the majority who are not particle physics fans, will just be very confused right now, so I'll keep on going. Lux started taking data around 2013, it ended around 2016, it set leading constraints on dark matter limits and masses, and it found absolutely nothing again. So, still some room for improvement, even though we see some significant improvements in the detector setup in experiments like Lux. But there's still room for improvement. And there's room for improvement in the way that I'm presenting too, because I've just thrown a bunch of terms at you here, and you're just sat there kind of confused as to what I'm talking about. So let's go to another quick physics alert. And let's explain what photomultiplier tubes are. Short, for, short is the PMTs. The clue is in the name to an extent. You get a photo, a photon, a bit of light, and you multiply it into a more intense signal. So you get a bit of light comes in, you produce an electron, that electron hits another plate, which produces two electrons, which produces four, which produces eight, which becomes a bit of current in your circuit and a little blip on a computer monitor. For all intents and purposes, this is a very, very expensive and very fine-tuned camera. I also brought up the idea of a time projection chamber. This is a tank, not full of, well, full of whatever. It could be full of gas if you wanted. But it's a tank with a magnetic or electric field inside of it and a series of tracking layers or whatever, so you can detect where a particle goes. Anything that goes inside the chamber is tracked as it goes through in one way or another. And you can use the way that it is tracked to work out what kind of trajectory it took. You can project its position and time through this chamber. And also on top of that, from this data, work out some properties about the particle. So like how energetic it was, what its charge was, and which way it bent, that sort of thing. So we're going to go through the simple history of the LZ experiment, as we've seen before. We're going to summarize some of the points, and I'm going to teach an interesting lesson in the process. This is just what I'm cutting out here. So we start off with Zeppelin, and it doesn't find dark matter. And then some upgrades are proposed for it. We design Zeppelin 2. And then a lot of researchers from Zeppelin start working on Zeppelin 2, and it doesn't find dark matter. At the same time, Zeppelin 3 is designed as a proposal. It's interesting that both were being developed at more or less the same point with newer technologies. However, and then, and then academics come from Zeppelin to Zeppelin 3. Thank you, past me. But then Zeppelin 2 finishes before Zeppelin 3 finishes. Makes sense with the numbers. And a lot of academics go from Zeppelin 2 to Zeppelin 3. Zeppelin 3 develops some world-leading detection methods for dark matter, same as Zeppelin 2 does. And a lot of other experiments out there are designed very similarly in that they are a huge tank of liquid or gas, usually in the field of neutrino physics. But you get these other experiments like Xenon, Warp, ARDM, Super K. And these also take on a lot of the researchers and a lot of the technology developed in Zeppelin 2 and 3. Now along comes Lux. It has more developments on top of the technology. It develops this very nice dual phase detection system, which again, we'll get back to. And a lot of these academics are starting to reach the end of their tenure on these experiments. So they're like, hey, let's hop onto Lux. A couple of other experiments also working in neutrino physics, such as Snow, Ice Cube, and what I believe is the best name I've ever heard for a physics experiment, Double Choose. And a lot of academics from these are also very interested in working on Lux. Lux proceeds to find no dark matter whatsoever. <laughs> My supervisor, Hans Krauss, began uh, for quite a while in his career, worked on cooling of helium within dark matter detectors. Specifically, he did a lot of work for Super CDMS and Edelweiss. 
However, we eventually realized there are much better ways to detect dark matter than using helium, and it's also incredibly expensive to keep at that kind of temperature. So he started to hop off onto other experiments. So when an experiment like LZ comes along, proposing an even more accurate version of Lux with some of Zeppelin's technology applied to it, he immediately jumps on board of this as well as every single other collaboration that exists at the time where there's a lot of academics at the end of their tenure. So why do I build an incredibly complicated map like this? Well, it's to hit home one other point that I don't think I've brought up quite as much as I should here, which is that when people like me talk about the steps of going from one collaboration to another, it's usually a lot more complicated than that. And there's a lot of people willing to collaborate in a lot of people in a lot of places, all either trying to compete or collaborate. And it becomes this very interesting mess. I should add that a lot of experiments on CERN are not like this, but that's because they're not as fun as we are. So we're almost reaching the end of the uh, physics alerts that I've been warning you about for so often. And it would be completely the end, but I'm just too interested in talking about little bits and bobs about my work, you know? But at the same time, I also promised you before that we were going to have a look at some plots that help you represent how much we know about dark matter. So this is one of those plots. On the x-axis, we have the mass of a potential WIMP particle going from around 1 GeV on the left-hand side, around the mass of a proton, to 1,000 GeV, 1,000 protons worth of mass. On the y-axis, we have a term called cross-section. Now, this is a complicated term to explain, and I'm not going to explain it because someone smarter than me will tell me that I've explained it badly. But for all intents and purposes, there is a relation between cross-section and how likely something is to happen. The higher your cross-section, the more likely something is to happen. So you've got this cross-section on the y-axis. How You've got the likelihood of, of a thing being interacting and on the y-axis and a mass on the x-axis. And then you've got these lines going across. Now, each of these lines is attached to a specific experiment. And if the interactability, the cross-section of dark matter was above any of these lines for these specific masses, we probably would have seen it to within like 90% confidence, I believe is what we go for here. So by running these experiments for as long as we have, you can still set constraints by the very fact that we haven't seen dark matter within the time that this experiment's been running for. And here you can see Lux set its specific limits, Panda X set its limits at one point, Xenon 1T did as well. Xenon 1T also found a very interesting result that may or may not be a false positive about a couple of months ago, and everyone's currently ripping their throats out trying to see if it was the dark matter detection that we've been looking for for so long. I look forward to looking back at this in like a year's time and laughing at myself for from one perspective or the other, you know? It's also worth noting that there's only a couple of experiments on this detection, but you can also see there's this... Uh, peachy sort of color towards the bottom and this is something called the neutrino flaw which we'll get back to in a bit quite a bit actually but this diagram is quite simple usually the diagrams look a uh, a bit more complicated yeah there's a lot of experiments doing this sort of work and they're all setting their own constraints we're not going to look at this for much longer Let's instead look at a really pretty diagram of the LZ detector. Look at that, we've got, we've got seven tons of xenon in the center. We've got a bunch of voltage going in to keep the electric field going, which we'll get to. We've got a bunch of photomultiplier tubes on the top and the bottom. We got more PMTs on the outside and a bunch of wonderful toys feeding in and feeding out data as much as we possibly can. But it's, uh, it's one thing looking at a picture like this as we are here, and it's another thing watching a really shitty animated PowerPoint slide explaining how it works with terrible visuals. And if you're looking for one of those, you are in luck today, my friend, in a slide or two's time at least. But first, we're going to have one of our last physics alerts. You can breathe a sigh of relief soon. And we're going to talk about a couple of processes in LZ. The first of these is scintillation. 
Now this is a word, certainly. It's a word that exists. You could win at Scrabble with it. But this is, if a particle passes through a material, it can cause this material to scintillate, which is just a flashing light. I guess from a certain point of view, putting a current through a noble gas causes it to scintillate and make a neon sign glow like it does. This is a smaller version of that. Noble gases are very good at this, in particular xenon, which is why we use it. There's also this process called electroluminescence, which kind of says what it is again. Any uh, noble gases that have energy will scatter their way through other sections of the noble gas and produce a bunch of electrons. This is because of the electric field changing within the detector and on top of that, the electrons that have been emitted will be pulled through the detector with an electric field and eventually become photons which can be detected. So there's these two processes going on in the detector, a flash of light and a second spitting out of electrons. And both of these in combination are used to detect our dark matter candidates in a way that I will explain very shortly. So we're finally at it, the big question, big enough that it fills its own slide here for a second. And that is, how does LZ work? Well, you've got this tank of water, right? And on the outside of that tank of water, you've got a bunch of photomultiplier tubes to detect what's coming in and out. And then inside that tank of water, you've got a tank of liquid xenon. And at the top of that tank of liquid xenon, you've got a bunch of photomultiplier tubes. So you've got this pair of tanks at very high pressure, riddled with detectors around the outside. And into that detector system comes a bit of dark matter. It comes in nice and quick, penetrates all the layers as it should, and it bumps into some of the liquid xenon. Now, stop me if you've heard this before, we, it recoils a little bit, we deposit a bit of energy, and it starts to emit. Only this time, rather than emitting an electron, it emits a photon in the scintillation process, and this photon is immediately picked up. However, this xenon atom has then recoiled in the same period of time and has produced a bunch of electrons. These electrons have been dragged through the electric field, which has in turn produced a couple of photons, which can then shortly be picked up by some of the photomultiplier tubes. This pair of signals is what we mean by a dual phase detection system. There's a bit of nuance there in that there's sections of the liquids then on that are actually gas, but I'm going to sweep that under the rug for now. And using both of these measurements in combination allows a much more rigorous analysis to be done, which is especially useful when a lot of the candidates that we're looking at now with this rather than the lighter candidates that we're looking at with NewsG are at the same sort of mass range and are therefore easy to mix up with other regular forms of matter like protons and kaons and stuff like that. So it becomes much more important to have these two separate signals you can use together to get a better result. But that more or less is how LZ works. That's an entire PhD right there. So to summarize what, what uh, LZ is up to right here, we're gonna, we're gonna lower the cross section limits we're going to find dark matter, hopefully, though that one is, is somewhat improbable, you know, we'll see. We're going to do some neutrino physics, which we'll get back to. Again, it's in bold. And we're going to do some other things, too. So, uh, yay, we're going to do it. We're going to find dark matter. Watch this space. But I throw up neutrino physics here for what is going to be our final physics alert. It's the end of an era, everyone. So what is a neutrino? I'm gonna keep it very simple. It's a tiny, uninteracting thing. It doesn't do much. It flies through most things that it, it, it flies through without doing much. It's attached to the weak interaction. When you produce a bunch of beta radiation, you also produce a bunch of neutrinos, and you're being riddled through your body with like millions of these things every single second. So there's a lot of them and they don't do much. We didn't know they had mass until like 2000 or so. A couple of experiments proved that they did some weird physics that would only happen if we knew that they had mass. So we still don't know much about the neutrino and that kind of hits it home right there. Specifically, there's this thing that I mentioned before called the neutrino flaw. This is a point at which if you are searching for things that are less probable to decay than that sort of flaw, if the, if the probability of dark matter interacting is less than that flaw, neutrinos go from being this thing that barely exists to becoming quite a significant background to the point where you just can't detect anything. 
And this is, comes off as quite a cool buzzword for that kind of situation. But with every cloud comes a silver lining. And the silver lining there is that if you reach this point where you can routinely detect neutrinos, especially at this point where we presume that we'll be detecting neutrinos in, in something like this quite regularly, what would we see and how do they behave? So those are things we can start to investigate with LZ to an extent, steal those from other experiments that are looking at them in more detail. We are also searching for the very rare neutrino, neutrinoless double beta decay. This has never been seen before, very rare, but it does what it says on the tin. You're producing two beta particles, two electrons, and you're doing so without emitting any neutrinos. Now go and look up a diagram of this if you want. It's an interesting process and you can see why it's so unlikely. But if it does happen, it proves that the neutrino is a Majorana particle, or Majorana, I've never checked. But a Majorana particle is a thing that is its own antiparticle, which is the only way it would be able to do this interaction. And if that doesn't make much sense to you, it also doesn't make much sense to me. Don't worry much about it. The physics will be written as soon as we prove that the thing actually exists. And until then, it's just a bunch of theorists spitballing ideas, you know? But it's still a cool idea, and it's something that LZ will be hoping to probe with a greater precision than any other experiments in the world. So uh, pat on the back for us there. So I've left you on the edge of your seats here. I've introduced LZ, talked about the kind of research it'll be doing, and you're saying to me now, Dan, Dan, when is this going to be a thing? Well, I'm proud to announce that LZ will start data taking in April 2020. Yeah, COVID didn't exactly do us any favors there. The detector is currently sat just above the home stake mine, just kind of waiting to be put in place in South Dakota. I believe some engineers are trying to flush the thing out with argon or something, you know, things that engineers do. As soon as it's in place though, like we can, we can place limits on dark matter, we can research neutrino physics, we can work with experiments like LSST, AMS, CAST, which are experiments that I'll be talking about in more detail in my other World Space Week talk in a couple of days time. And we'll be data taking until around 2025. Now around this point, we'll see another experiment starting to reach the end of its lifespan. And the plan will be to build a bigger and better LZ to install in around 2030. Generation 3, we call it. Now, this bigger LZ with more xenon, more detectors, more novel detection methods, and a greater chance of finding dark matter is where I come in. Designing that, designing detection methods within that, while also conducting a world-leading data analysis in the hopes of finding this dark matter candidate as soon as possible. So watch this space. At this point, I'm legally obliged to advertise my field as much as I possibly can, as much as I already haven't within the last 40 minutes or so. So I'll advertise Dark Matter Day here. This is the 31st of October, 2020, and it's an interesting day. A lot of, a lot of uh, universities across the UK and across the world, in fact, will be hosting a couple of events to really get people interested in dark matter as much as they can. Now, naturally, things have been a bit more difficult this year because of the fact that uh, COVID-19 is a thing. Sorry to bring it up again. But if you check out the website, there's still a couple of events going on. So watch this space. In particular, I, I think that the uh, Xenon experiment is going to do a little video tour. They're going to get one of their engineers to go down and show us the thing in person. So uh, I'm looking forward to that at least. I'll uh, see you there. But uh, enough promotion. I've got to thank you right now for sticking around during this presentation. And congratulations. You have been introduced to a couple of particle physics concepts that you probably weren't familiar with before. You've remembered, I assume, at least half of them over the course of this. And again, there's not going to be a class test to check. So you can just lie to yourself and see you've been able to soak up everything like a sponge. So that's good. I've introduced you to my kind of PhD work and you've understood quite a bit of it. And that's commendable. Good job. You've actually done well today being able to stick through this entire presentation, or at the very least for skipping through to the very end of it like a cheater. If the other half of the stuff that you didn't quite soak up perfectly ha still hasn't stuck towards the end of this, if you find yourself eating dinner and thinking about dark matter, as many, many of us do, send me an email at my fancy Oxford email here. 
And uh, if you're interested in having me for outreach or whatnot, I'd also be happy to take that on board. I really like talking about this kind of stuff. I, it's very difficult to shut me up about it usually. But with those things being said, thank you so much for watching. I think I'll be around for questions and answers afterwards. But if not, send me an email. And uh, thank you for having me, Astrosock. Cheers.